This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 29th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what did the legislature do with their votes Monday and where are we headed from there? Second, At the same time as we are dealing with a fiscal meltdown in Alaska, there's also a federal one going on in D.C. Why that relates to Alaska. And third, why the Alaska LNG project is headed into sleep mode. And now, let's join Michael. Let's talk about this. You were I was just asking you if you were enraged. You said no, but there's a specific reason why. I quit listening about the end near the end of the day. I kind of quit paying attention to what was going on because I was trying to get home. And and so I just was like, wow, a little discouraged, a little disgruntled. You said you kept your ear to the ground nor- about, you know, four or five hours beyond where you normally would. And that made all the difference at this point. You took the, the road less traveled and that made all the difference. Tell me. Uh, what does Monday's uh, vote mean, and and what are the, what what am I missing here? You're I'm missing something that apparently you caught when I was not paying attention. Well, I think the most significant event of the day, and the one that's not in the morning papers because they'd sort of folded up the reporters had sort of sort of folded up uh, at the end of the legislative session. I think the most significant event of the day was the governor's press release that came out uh, early in the evening. Uh, responding to the actions of the legislature, and the governor's the governor's press release is is highly detailed. It's only one page, but highly detailed about what he intends to do on the bills that passed yet passed yesterday. He divides them into the two bills: HB 2001, which is the operating budget, and SB 2002, which is the capital budget, and which is the one. That, that you were talking about in the previous segment where a bunch of, of R's voted uh, for the capital budget. Uh, and that vote happened uh, early in the day, and so uh, it sort of got the most press. Here's what the governor says about the capital budget. While months overdue, today's action represents an important step in the legislature bringing this gridlock to an end, said Governor Dunleavy. My team and I will be thoroughly reviewing the details of the bill, bill But, and this is the important part, but believe it represents significant progress in moving Alaska forward, particularly for items like the Alaska Performance Scholarship, WAMI, PCE, and efforts to capture more than $1 billion in federal transportation infrastructure dollars, critical to keeping our economy growing and and our communities moving. Essentially what the governor's saying, end of quote, essentially what the governor's saying is, I'm okay with most of the capital bill budget. Right. Um, and and the, the things that he's mentioning with respect to the performance scholarship, whammy, PCE, those were covered by the reverse sweep. Those were the things that had gotten a lot of attention um, about, about, about keeping them in the CBR as opposed to letting them be reverse sweeped and funding all those programs. And the governor is essentially saying, I'm okay with the reverse sweep. Now, he goes on to say with respect to the capital budget, that he says, while I intend to sign SB 2002, I will exercise my line item veto where necessary. My guess, uh, without having talked to anybody in the administration, but my guess is that's he's what that's going to focus on is the $250 million blank check CBR authorization that got included in the um, in the capital budget bill and the one that 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 got Tammy so worked up and others. Uh, in the legislature so worked up. Uh, Sarah Rasmussen at one point had said, 
Um, I, I, I am upset by this. I'm going to vote for the capital budget because I think there are important things in the capital budget, but I'm upset by the $250 million. So my guess is what we're going to have on the capital budget is a large acceptance um, and, and a, a, a smallish veto focused around that $250 million that, that when you sort of parse through all the statements made uh, during the course of the last several days will be upheld. Uh, that you'll have enough votes to uphold that. My guess also, and, and Mia will be interesting on this point, but my guess also is the governor's position on the capital budget, which is largely I'm okay with it, got conveyed to various to various members of the legislature during the course of the week, the day, whatever whatever right. period of time you want to pick. Right. And so it was sort of a free vote for them. Um, they knew the governor was gonna was gonna sign it, and so. And so voting for the capital budget, knowing that he was going to come back with vetoes, uh, line item vetoes on parts of the capital budget that they likely disagreed with, um, it was sort of a free vote to go ahead and vote for the CBR. So I'm not or for the for the for the reverse sweep. So I'm not I don't think that given the governor's position, I don't think that uh, that the legislators that voted for the capital budget really um are going to be in for a lot of criticism, at least by the administration, right? Uh, because the administration seems to go along with it. Now, all of that changes. <laughs> all of that mindset changes when you get to HB 2001, which is the operating budget. But keep in mind, I mean, a lot of the focus during the day was on the CBR vote and, and ours peeling off, and I, I'm sorry, on the capital budget, and ours peeling off and voting for uh, the capital budget. The, there hasn't been enough. There wasn't a lot of focus on what happened on the operating budget. Right. But well, but keep in mind on the operating budget that only passed the House twenty three fifteen uh, with two absent, and the two absent uh, were uh, Mark Newman and and Ben Carpenter, people you would expect to be be a no vote. So you've got likely seventeen votes against. The operating budget, uh, uh, right there. You over in the Senate, you have the caucus rule that effectively prevented people from, except for Laura, effectively present, prevented people from voting uh, their conscience. Uh, Shelley and Mike walked out instead of having to vote <clears throat> for it in, in accordance with the caucus rule. Um, and but but the caucus rule doesn't apply unless they've changed that rule too. But the caucus rule doesn't apply on uh, uh, veto overrides. Right. So, so the governor and, and, the, and the governor's statement in his press release about the operating budget uh, is, is much different than on the capital budget. Uh, here's his statement. The addbacks to spending to the tune of $400 million are yet another attempt to blow up the size of government. I stand by the decisions on June 28, which was his veto, and the focus we made on providing a, subst a sustain sustain sustainable budget and sustainable systems these reductions are not meant to harm Alaska or Alaskans, but to turn the corner and make the necessary changes in order to put Alaska on a sustainable path forward. While we will consider a limited number of additions to the budget, we consider the vast majority of FY20 of the FY20 budget final. And by that, I think he means final as of the time he did the vetoes. Right. It's time to move forward. Well, so it, it, on the operating budget, he's got a completely different position, and if you that he that there's going to be wide scale vetoes uh, of of the increases that the legislature passed. Uh, that's also got the PFD in the operating budget, so we'll see how he deals with that. But when you when you look at the votes on the operating budget, there's enough there right now uh, to to uphold a veto override, right, or to, or to uphold the veto, right. To, well, to, it, just let me say this, because, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I didn't come out with flaming swords and, and everything else this morning and people asking why I'm not enraged. I mean, I understand that there's politics involved in all the people that we just talked about, Revac and Shaw and Raspi. I mean, they are in districts that are essentially purple. I mean, they are, you know, they're they're red leaning to blue or blue leaning, leaning into red. And so there there's a political reality into some of this. And and so I understood this. And I did actually see this statement last night uh, before I went to bed. I did see the governor's statement, and, and I understood that. And I and in seeing the votes, I understand that they're trying to, to split the baby here, which 
is is a hard thing. And you're right. I mean, the governor, you know, you're getting mixed signals. The governor wants the capital budget, but the minority needs to remain strong. It's just this is this is I think I'm worried about the damaging effect of voting in the one hand and then having to come back if he veto over if he vetoes things again and having to take a whole new round of criticism. And I'm just wondering if they would have if they'll have the chutzpah to stand tall in the long run uh, on this. And that that's my main question. Again, I'm not. I'm not beating them up. I, I, did, I haven't said anybody's a turncoat or, or, or a dirty, rotten scoundrel. I, I'm just saying, you know, to me it was a game of chicken. But, in, in, I mean, I will agree to say that because of the governor's support, you know, they, this was kind of a free vote in a lot of ways for these people. It's something they can go back to their districts on, these purple districts, and say, look, I voted for this. You can't beat me up on it kind of thing. Yeah, in the end, there really, I mean, the, the, there were two things in the capital budget, well, three things in the capital budget. One was some was capital spending, uh, for, actually a fairly limited amount of capital spending, but but some capital spending. And, and you can always go in and pick out, well, I wouldn't have voted for this or I wouldn't have voted for that. But sort of in large part, there was capital spending uh, that was that was that was fairly, fairly constrained and, and, and fairly reasonable. And then there was uh, the the reverse sweep. And then there was the $250 million uh, blank check CBR authorization. And I think, I think what's going on here, I think the governor saying, I'm okay with the capital, uh, with the capital. I'm okay with the reverse sweep. Um, and, but, but I'm, I'm going to, he didn't say the 250 million, but that's, that's really what uh, has, has irritated large parts of the legis- of the Republicans in the legislature, and I think that's what he'll focus on. So I, you, you, to, to, to vote against the bill would have meant that, that you wouldn't have gotten, or for him to veto uh, uh, large portions of the bill would mean you wouldn't get the capital spending that he thinks is okay. You wouldn't get the reverse sweep that he thinks, that he appears to think is okay. Um, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't get those two things. So the vote, the vote on the capital budget was really, yes, Here's the bill. Pick pick out the bad, veto the bad, send it back to us. And again, if you parse through the statements on the floor, I think you'll see that there's going to be um, enough votes on the floor uh, on the on the veto of that thing in the capital budget that that the people don't like to uphold the veto. So I, I that it makes sense to me to have voted for the capital budget in that context. Once you knew, I think the big deal was the reverse sweep. Once you knew right. the governor was okay with the reverse sweep, I think it makes sense to vote for the capital budget. My question then remains, what leverage and, – and, and again, I'm in agreement with this is why I didn't come out, you know, flaming and, and, and uh, you know, and, and lambasting everybody in sight. But uh, the, the question is, what leverage does this give b- back to the minority? I mean, I guess I could say the veto override would be the only leverage that they have left at this point. But other than that, pretty much all the other cards have been taken off the table. Am I missing something? Well, the veto override, I mean, there's going to be a lot of hue and cry. I mean, people people were, Twitter was was ecstatic at the vote on the capital budget, thinking that they'd reverse the governor. But a lot of what people care about, uh, the, the, uh, the spending for senior benefits, the, all sorts of things that are, that are in the operating budget, um, you, you've got a fairly strong no vote uh, on the operating budget, and I think, and I think the uh, a, a veto proof uh, or a veto uh, override proof. There we go. Uh, uh, vote on the operating budget. So I think there's going to be um, a, s- some leverage, not as much maybe as if he'd held back PCE, but some leverage uh, with the operating budget to go for the minority to go back to the majority and say, look. Do you want a deal on this issue? Do you want a deal on the PFD, um, and and move the and move the PV, PFD forward back to the back to the what the law requires? Uh, if you do, you know we can deal on some of these other things, perhaps uh, on the operating budget side. Uh, and if the if the majority says no, we don't want to deal on the PFD, then then you know you've got fairly fairly deep vetoes that will go on on the operating budget. So I, there, it's not as much leverage as if he had held back some of the stuff on the reverse sweep, uh, maybe. I mean, I <laughs> the discussion between he and Lyman, for example, about whether or not I'm going to veto PCE would have been an interesting discussion. But um, 
probably not as much leverage as if he'd held back on some of the stuff on the reverse sweep, but there's still leverage uh, out there. We may not end up with a three with a with a full PFD, uh, but there's still some leverage, and the minority looks fairly strong. If you look at if you look at that vote on the operating budget, and you look at what the likely vote in the Senate would be, the likely additional votes in the Senate will be on a veto override, the minority looks fairly strong. Uh, in, in a fairly strong uh, bargaining position with respect to uh, uh, items in the operating budget. Brad, um, you know, again, I, I, this is, I, I just want to say, this is why I wasn't quite so dejected as I could have been, yeah. because after seeing the governor's proclamation last night, I realized, okay, so there was some political cover from the governor to say, this is kind of what I wanted, but I, I, I still, I'm really concerned about whatever leverage that they may have had, and just the way that the legislature, the legislative majority in the House has treated the minority, I just felt like they were just giving up so much in the way of leverage. That that really, and, and as I said earlier, the precedent of allowing this bill to even try and stand as some kind of quasi-veto override without a supermajority, the precedent of that really bothered me. Yeah, I understand all that. And and frankly, if if I had been in the House on the capital budget, I might have voted uh, differently. I might have voted with 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 what came out to be the the minority on that uh, because of my concerns about the reverse sweeps. But once you once once you recognize the governor, um, so, so here's here's the calculate calculus at the governor stand from the governor's standpoint. There are things in the capital budget because of the way this process got worked. There are things in the capital budget that he wants. Um, uh, the the funding for the 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 criminal reform bill, for example, for uh, for SB 49, or I think that's the right number, um, is is in the is was in the capital budget. Right. Um, we he he wants the he wants all of us want the 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 cap the state uh, contribution toward the federal match or the state match on the federal contribution toward infrastructure to, toward the transportation. So there are things in the capital budget he wants. If if the legislature again had had voted against the CBR draw, we effectively wouldn't have a capital budget. So the choice is give me the budget. I, there are things in there I want. Give me the budget. I'll redline out uh, the things I don't I don't want that I don't think are fair. And again, I focus on the 250 million blank check. I think that's going to be part of it. Should be part of it. Uh, I'll line I, I'll line those out. You guys have made clear in your statements that those are things that you're that you're uh, uh, likely going to vote to 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 help me with to to help uh, uphold the veto uh, if they come back to you. But in the meantime, I'll get the things. We'll we'll at least get these things that we need. Um, uh, the 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 funding for the crime package, uh, the the state match to the to the infrastructure the other things in the capital budget will get the things we need done and off the table um, and, 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 and move on with that. And I, you know, I understand that calculus um, where I, where I probably would differ with the administration is these reverse sweeps. I probably would have, um, and, and the governor still could, although he's indicated he's not going to, but even with the vote yesterday, the governor still could have vetoed some of the reverse sweeps and, um, and, and that's probably where I would differ with the administration. But other than that, I mean, basically the calculus is: give me a bill, I'll line through the stuff I don't like. You guys have said you're gonna, you're in your statements that you're that you're you don't like those either. You'll likely up, uh, vote to uphold them on the on on a veto, um, and and we'll move the capital budget off the table. On the operating budget, different deal. I'm gonna red red line the heck out of that thing. Uh, we're going back basically to where we were uh, when I did my last vetoes. And when you look at the vote, and, and that message got conveyed to the to the legislators, and when you look at the vote um, uh, by the legislators, they're essentially saying, "Yep, we're ready to go with you." Uh, there's enough. There's more than 16 that voted against it, uh, indicating that that they're ready to go with him on on those vetoes. So, I, it, it, all in all, it's it's not it's not a perfect messaging day, in the sense that you did sort of have these Republicans on the capital budget peel off one by one. And appear to succumb to, to pressure, and 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 you know if they did the if they do the same thing when the operating budget vetoes come back, that'll be a problem. Uh, but but so far they appear to be standing up on the operating budget, 
And I can understand, given where the governor's gone on the capital budget, I can understand now it took a while to get that because the governor wasn't clear where he was going. But but you can understand now why they were doing what they were doing on the capital budget. Ben Carpenter is in the chat room today and says we shouldn't confuse negotiation with manipulation. We assume one is happening when, in fact, the latter is all that has been occurring, um, which has been kind of my I mean, this I've been talking about this in a little bit different verbiage. I've been saying, you know, their idea of compromise is a, not a give and take, but a take and take. You know, you give, we take kind of thing. Uh, I got about 25 seconds. Is that kind of your feel on this as well, Brad? Yeah, we're not doing negotiation. I mean, this is this is we're, we're passing pieces of paper back and forth across the table. The legislature in the terms of bills and the governor in the terms of vetoes. It's not a negotiation. As much as it pains me to do so, we have to kind of look at the larger scale now onto the national politics with uh, number two and three of the weekly top three. Brad is trying to bring us back up to the uh, 10,000 foot view instead of the mi- the the, uh, ma- the micro view or in the macro view with his next item which he says we need to be paying closer attention to the federal elections and focusing on what's going on with the budget votes being cast right now in Washington DC Brad Michael I know you hate talking about national issues particularly when there are hot state issues going on and, and we certainly have those now but but this is a national issue that, that I think resonates into the 2020 uh, 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 elections in Alaska, uh, federal elections in Alaska. I think it relates to Don Young, who will be up for re-election, um, and to Dan Sullivan, who will be up uh, for re-election in 2020. And, and this, is, this, this, is, this is the federal equivalent. We're having the federal equivalent of the meltdown uh, on fiscal matters that, we, that we're having at the state. It's sort of sort of shocking that these two meltdowns are going on at, one, at the same time, but they are. The meltdown at the federal level, it, rela- uh, it relates to fiscal matters um, and relates to uh, negotiations that have gone on between Speaker Pelosi and, and the Trump administration over how to resolve a number of issues. And, and those issues include um, uh, the national debt limit uh, that we're running up against that the, the country can't issue any more debt uh, once it hits a hits the debt limit and how to deal with the we're coming up on the debt limit um, and and also uh, spending bills uh, for the for for the next fiscal year uh, the the Congress is uh, we're, we're at the end of the of the fiscal federal fiscal year we're coming up on the beginning of the federal fiscal year which is October 1 uh, and Congress is dealing with uh, and the administration is dealing with with what the spending is going to be um, We've had uh, essentially, from a fiscal standpoint, a fiscal conservative standpoint, we've had capitulation uh, on the part of the administration uh, with respect to to maintaining uh, 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 fiscally conservative uh, principles. The deal that that the that the administration has worked out uh, with with Congress is is to extend to move the debt limit, uh, uh, extend the debt limit by two years. Now they're not saying. I mean, this is part one of how bad it is. They're not saying we're going to move the debt limit from, say, $22 billion, which is about where the debt is now, to $25 billion, and we're going to limit over the next two years, which is how long this deal runs, we're going to limit the debt to that $3 billion. Instead, they just essentially said we're going to we're going to uh, uh, suspend the debt limit for two years, and whatever debt we run up in those two years is fine. <laughs> the, the debt limit will come back into effect. Uh, at the end of those two years, so as as Congressman Massey has put it, it's 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 not that it's not that we've extended the debt on the credit card from you know five thousand dollars to seventy five hundred dollars as 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 sometimes happens. We've just said whatever you run up in the next two years is fine, uh, and then we'll talk about it again at the end of the two years. That's part one of how bad of how bad this deal is. Part two is that they've ing- agreed to increase spending. When you extend this out over the over the next ten years, by about one point, it, 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 it increase the debt, national debt, increase deficits. When you extend this out over the next ten years, by about one point seven trillion dollars. Now we currently have roughly twenty billion, twenty trillion dollars of debt. They're going to run up another one point seven trillion dollars in deficit. This sets the stage for running up another one point seven trillion dollars in deficits over the next 10 years. To put that in context, 
the last spending deal they did in, in 2018, which I had a lot of heartburn about, and so did a lot of others, only increased <laughs> the deficit by 444, 440, $445 billion, half right. a trillion dollars. Right. Now, this deal runs up the deficit triple that, right. $1.7 trillion. <laughs> And 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 to put it in another context, the the, the tax cuts that we had in 2017 um, reduced revenue, uh, increased the deficit because they didn't they didn't offset that with with reductions in spending, reduced revenue by about 1.8 trillion dollars. This budget deal they just did is is increases the deficit the size of that tax cut. Right. So it's I mean, so we, we've just had an abdication of fiscal responsibility uh, at the federal level. Now, why does this relate to Alaska? It relates to Alaska in this sense. Don Young, who, who will tell everybody that listens uh, and even some that don't, that he's a fiscal conservative. Don Young voted with the Democrats against the majority of the Republicans for this spending deal. Right. There were nine Democrats, Blue Dog Democrats, fiscally conservative Democrats that voted against their party, against Speaker Pelosi, against this spending deal. Don Young voted for it. He voted to the left of nine uh, Blue Dog Democrats. I, I, I don't. Don Young cannot claim to be a fiscal conservative. I, he can claim to be a lot of other things. He cannot claim to be a fiscal conservative. Right. Well, and I want to say that, you know, I want to say that when it comes down to this, uh, you know, just to put it in perspective, because I've got, uh, um, you know, because I've got the issue uh, with uh, with Lee, who listens in quite frequently, just to put things in perspective and, and to break it down just a little bit differently. When we're talking specifically about uh, that that one point seven billion or one point seven trillion dollars, Brad was just saying suspending the debt uh, limit by that $4 billion, the $1.7 billion, for those of you who are not kind of keeping track at home or not really familiar, that's $1,700 billion. So, I mean, we're talking about, it, 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 it's we're, we're running into the realm of ludicrousness at this point, Brad. I mean, we have suspended reality uh, where basic arithmetic just doesn't seem to matter anymore, which is one of the reasons why I've quit even covering a lot of the national issues because I just don't think that there's the political will. People like Massey and others who have brought this to the attention to say, you know, this can't continue have been kind of poo-pooed and hushed out of the room. The bottom line is, is that, you know, the basic arithmetic says this can't continue indefinitely. Yep. And, and, and we just, we just put the afterburners on uh, this bill just puts the afterburners on, you know, sending us into, into whatever, orbit we're going to be in when when we're leaving to the next generation but i th i think this resonates i think this this is an issue in the fy in the in the 20 2020 election in alaska for both don young dan sullivan is yet to vote on it it's it's going to the senate this week i think it's going to be an issue in dan so if dan young votes with dot if dan sullivan votes with don young and votes to the left of democrats uh, in favor of this bill. I think it's going to be an issue in Dan Sullivan's election as well. Yeah, I agree. Brad Keithley, last minute here. Uh, we didn't get to number three, which is the uh, LNG gas line. Um, give us uh, give us your final thoughts here as we wrap up real quick. I, I think uh, we can go into this in a subsequent uh, discussion, but but I think uh, uh, the LNG project's going to sleep for a very long time. Uh, there was a speech uh, uh, presentation given by Joe uh, Dubler, who's the current chairman of the of the AGDC, the Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation project, uh, essentially saying China's off the table. There's no longer a deal with China. Uh, we're, we're ramping down uh, internal uh, our internal capability. We're going to partner more with the with the companies, which is good. Uh, but I think I think the the big headline of that is, is the China deal right. off the table. You synopsize it here in two minutes because I got to bring Mia on here at the top of the hour. So, uh, can you give us the synopsis of uh, your thoughts on the on the LNG gas? I mean, what does that spell for Alaska since the Chinese are out of the deal now? And I mean, does it take the final dirt nap here, or are we back to square one? I, I think I think we're gonna I think we're gonna take a nap here for for a fairly long time with respect to LNG. There will continue to be work on it, but we need a market, uh, uh, and we need market to participate in the funding. 
Uh, and if the Chinese deal is off the table, which is understandable given the trade war that we're in the middle of uh, and may be in for a long period of time, if uh, if the Chinese are off the uh, off the table in terms of a in terms of a deal, uh, I'm I'm not sure that we've we've got a market that uh, that can take the amount of LNG that we need to produce to make this economic. So, it's it's um for those who, as I have in the past, looked at at LNG as a potential revenue opportunity for the state, uh, and have looked at it as a potential way of spurring additional development on the North Slope. Uh, I think it's a disappointment. Uh, that it's that it's going to take a nap, uh, but I think we need to face the reality and uh, and and factor that reality into into our our uh, fiscal discussions and other discussions and uh, and and accept what it is and and uh, and move on. But it, it's gonna it's gonna take a long nap. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thanks so much for coming on board today. We appreciate you being part of it. Michael, thanks as always for having me. All right, thank you so much. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.